My name is Mike Aben, and welcome to my KSP campaign. At the conclusion of the last episode, we had left five brave Kerbonauts out in space in two separate missions and had set up their maneuvers in order to get them back to Kerbin Station in low Kerbin orbit. And we will be getting to them once again soon enough. But for now, what we have here, we have Chrissy out in the science buggy. Uh, this is actually my old school science buggy. Some people might recall it from quite a lot of episodes ago. I, I had a bigger science buggy that seemed to have uh, a stability issue. So I've gone back to the this old reliable one. And what it has on it now is a seismic sensor. And the seismic sensor allows me to collect some more science. So I'm going in around all the biomes in around the Kerbal Space Center, uh, scooping up the science. In fact, I had had this seismic sensor unlocked for quite some time, but it, it took a while, over 10 days, for me to rebuild the science buggy once I added the seismic sensor. It, it, it's a big time component for the first time you build it, but then once you start recovering them and you have those extra parts, the builds start to get a lot quicker after that. So anyway, Chrissy's just going to be out here, you know, doing a scan, collecting that, storing it in the cockpit, and going around. I think I'll also make my way over to the nearby shores, uh, nearby grasslands, and while I was on my way out that way, I decided I'd pay another visit to the monolith that's to the north of the Kerbal Space Center. You might recall that a um, number of episodes ago, I've been out here a couple of times before, and the last time I was out here, it seemed like it was getting bigger, and I, I sort of surmised from that that as you progress through the game, it's raising up out of the ground, kind of monitoring your progress, but it looks to me now here, well, it looks like it shrunk back down again, so... I don't know, maybe this is a glitch, maybe this is doing that. I'm curious if other people who are playing in career mode, what do they see when they come out here and check out this monolith? Because this is not making any sense to me now. Anyway, we'll have to save this mystery for later because this is a science gathering expedition and I even stopped at this little sliver of tundra that's to the west of the Kerbal Space Center. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in complete science scrounge mode here. I want to start unlocking more stuff on that tech tree. Um, and I went out and got the grasslands and then started heading my way back. And while we're on our way back to the runway so that we can recover 100% of this vessel, minus the cost of fuel, of course, uh, I do want to mention that this isn't it for the seismic sensor uh, science part. Um, thanks to the interstellar mod, which I do have installed, though you haven't seen much of it, some, hopefully soon you'll be starting to see some of the cooler things that come with interstellar. But uh, for now... What Interstellar does is actually modify this piece just a little bit. You can collect seismic data the normal way, the way I'm doing here, but you can also use an impactor. You got to turn on the sensor and then use an impactor to record seismic da um, data, which is a little bit more how a real seism seism seismograph seismograph that's the word I'm looking for would work. You need to have some sort of vibration going through the Earth or going through Kerbin in order to make this thing work. And so what you need is an impactor, something to crash into the surface. And I have a plan for that, but it's going to involve multiple vessels at the same time. So it's going to have to be for a f episode down the road once I have all those vessels in play. But it's pretty cool and it's quite the science magnet as well. But even with just the regular seismic scans, uh, this little mission got me 76 science with, in addition to science that I transmitted down from the moon, I transmitted all the science that the Korion had, uh, got me 191 science, which is more than enough to unlock another tech node. And there's so many things here that could be useful to me, but I could resist it no longer. I had to go with supersonic flight. I, I, I'm so tired of those basic jet engines. So this gives me the better jet engines. It gives me the ram air intakes. I should be able to go higher and faster with my jets. It's going to take two and a half days for this uh, techno to unlock. And I don't have any contracts that need it. But I really want to start building better jets. Yeah, we were talking just a bit ago about impactors, though I suppose this is really the opposite of an impactor. This is the ascent stage from Junksat 5, which you saw last episode and is now on its way to Minmus, and it is returning back into Kerbin's atmosphere to be recovered. And I've done, I've shown you this before, but I've been playing around with the parachute configurations just a little bit. I now have these uh, inline uh, parachutes rather than just using the radial parachutes that come with uh, 
real shoots, the real shoots mod. And so what I do is I have the top parachute, the radio one at the top only has a single parachute and it opens up first, adds, acts as a little bit of a drogue. And at the bottom I have two radial parachutes, both on the same side, and I want two of them because they're supporting that heavy engine and they're going to deploy just a little bit later. There they go. And the whole idea was to play around with this and see if I can get some sort of balance. And in fact, once all the parachutes are fully deploy deployed, this thing is pretty much horizontal. And I accomplish that by playing around with the parachute's material because that affects the amount of drag that they have. So the lower parachutes are nylon, the two at the, near the engine, and the upper one is silk, which has less drag. And I got this to be pretty much horizontal, and the reason why I was doing this is because I was finding I was having trouble with my lifters falling over once they touch down. Even when they're on the water, they can fall over and still do damage to themselves. Um, and you got to play around a little bit with the materials with different size lifters. I found with my bigger lifters that I was better off going with uh, nylon for the top parachute and then Kevlar, even heavier material, for the lower parachute. But this one right here, it just touches down just beautifully. No chance of damage at all. Uh, yeah, this is working nicer and nicer. With that done, why don't we jump out to the Karine, which is now just 20 minutes away from its transfer burn to get Jeb and Carol and Bill back home. And you can see here how the Karine's orbit about the moon is now right in line with the moon's orbit around Kerbin, which means we are now at the moment where we need to uh, do our burn to get out of here. Before we do the burn, let's do some final tweaking. So we'll come out here, we'll take a look at the periapsis. Ooh, it's 80 kilometers. That's out of Kerbin's atmosphere. I'd rather that be in Kerbin's atmosphere, but let's, we'll adjust this simply by adjusting the exact timing. So I'm just uh, moving it at one, one second at a time, and you can see I'm bringing down the periapsis just by doing that. And when the periapsis is at its lowest, that's when you know you're in the right position to perform the burn. And you know, it always does seem weird when you can see Kerbin right there, and it doesn't look like I am burning anywhere near the right direction to get back to Kerbin, but this is the right way to do it, because you gotta remember, I am moving with the moon, with the moon's orbital velocity, so in order to fall back down to Kerbin, I need to cancel out that velocity, or at least some of that velocity, and that means ejecting myself in a direction that is opposite to the direction in which the moon is going around in its orbit. And as we say goodbye to the moon, it's time for us to get over to Glafia and Luya, who are also getting ready to adjust their trajectory to intercept with Kerbin Station. Yeah, there's nobody on Kerbin Station right now, but... Uh, it's going to be a busy place soon enough. Now, Glafia and Luya are just in an 80-kilometer orbit and only need to get to the 120-kilometer orbit that Kerbin Station is in. So this is a pretty routine and mundane transfer. But uh, I did discover one thing here, and that is that the green light here is not attached to an action group. So I opened up Action Group Manager, and uh, it's all grayed out. Now, you may have recalled that uh, this happened to me a couple of episodes ago during an ascent, and in fact, uh, partially contributed to the failure of a particular mission. But um, now it's happening for no good reason, and I ended up doing a little bit of exploration onto the uh, forums and discovered that this doesn't seem to be an uncommon problem. Uh, so I uninstalled Action Group Manager and reinstalled it again, and that didn't seem to make the problem go away, and there doesn't seem to be a fix out there, at least that I could discover. So uh, I might have to put Action Group Manager to bed and uh, kind of give up on it for a little bit and uh, explore perhaps some other options. It's not that particularly vital of a mod anyway to what I want to do. Now this particular curse dock has not only no RCS, it actually has no docking port since I reappropriated it some uh, some episodes ago. So we're just going to park it in alongside the uh, Kerbin station and then Glafia is just going to get out there and connect it together with some KAS fuel pipes just to keep it from floating away. So there we go, we've got these two now safe and sound. I'm going to leave them exactly where they are for now. And then jump ahead in time a few hours as the Karayan is getting ready to do its first aerobraking pass. 
and you've seen me aero brake this particular vehicle a couple of times before so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it once again I used uh, the trajectories mod to predict what the G's would be as uh, I went through my aero braking maneuver and I tried to keep it in around a maximum of about 0.2 of a G and the first pass went without any issues whatsoever but it was a little less than three hours later as the Karine was coming around for its second pass that things got a little interesting. Okay so once again I'm keeping an eye on my time to carry axis as well as my vertical velocity because once I get past periapsis then I know that I'm on my way up and the worst of this is over so what's that 20 seconds to periapsis 15 seconds to periapsis oh oh jeez okay obviously something just exploded <laughs> oh, no a couple of things just exploded well in all of this I can't really tell what it was. I don't think it was anything significant, and the whole craft still seems to be tracking through it okay. Uh, I am past periapsis now and on my way up, so the worst of this is over. Let's hope what exploded wasn't too uh, important. <laughs> well, it turned out what exploded were those deployable solar panels, those big deployable solar panels that come from homegrown rocketry. Yeah, there used to be two of them on here, and now there are none, and you can see that space in between where those static solar panels are. So, I mean, at least I do have the static solar panels as backup, so that's a good thing. The radiator is still there, so that is also a good thing. Oh, uh, yeah, so obviously, I think what ended up happening there is that, you know, on the first pass, they heated up, and they didn't cool down enough uh, before the second pass. I also think that current version of Kerbal Space Program isn't exactly handling heat distribution amongst the craft particularly well, and that might have played a small factor in this too. Anyway, it's nothing that can't be repaired by an industrious engineer, their trusty wrench, and good old Kerbal inventory system. Um, this, These two aero braking passes brought my Apoapsis is down to about 1300 kilometers. The orbital period is now down to about an hour and 20 minutes. It's going to take one or two more passes before I have this down to the point where I'm ready to do my rendezvous with the space station. But in the meantime, supersonic flight is just about to be, its research is just about completed. So I think this is a good opportunity for a bit of a diversion. Now, Supersonic not only unlocked a new engine and new air intakes, it also unlocked these Mark II parts, including this Mark II cockpit, which can hold two Kerbals. Uh, we got a variety of these different shaped fuel cans now, different sized fuel tanks that we can put on here, as well as this sweet cargo bay, which just looks fantastic. Maybe a shuttle might be in order sometime in the near future, but for now... I'm going to put my energy towards a jet, and what I really want is a supersonic high-altitude jet that can get me around Kerbin quickly and get up to those high-altitude survey contracts. Uh, so let's see what we got. We got this XJ48K Vector engine. That looks pretty sweet. And I played around with some variety of different wing configurations, but decided that, you know, traditional's probably the best. Now remember when it comes to plane design, you do want to pay attention to where the center of mass and the center of lift is, and you want to put the center of mass just a little bit ahead of the center of lift, and don't forget to play around with fuel cans, and, or sorry, the amount of fuel in the fuel can, so as the fuel gets drained, um, pay attention to where that center of mass goes, because you don't want it to ever drift behind the center of lift, that's always an important thing. But anyway, as I was playing around with this, I thought, you know what, this thing looks underpowered to, to me. I think I think more power, more power is what we're going to need. So yes, three engines, not two engines. What was I even thinking about with three engines? And then it's time to take a look at the air intakes. Now, actually, these things do have uh, air intakes built into them. So, uh, but I, I, I really want to make sure I can really take in the air at high altitude. So I put on these ram air intakes. 
And yeah, I think this thing is starting to look pretty good. Definitely good enough for a first run. So let's uh let's get this baby up in the sky and see what she can do. Okay, so here we are on the runway in simulation mode. You know, this is just testing and oh my gosh, take a look at this cockpit. Woo! Screens everywhere and a nice view too. All right. But lights on. Ooh, those rear landing gear are backwards. Okay, we'll have to fix that later. No big deal. Let's get ready to go. So brakes off. SAS on. Engage engines. Let's go. Throttle up. And we're away. Ooh, that was nice. Took off without any issues at all at well under 100 meters per second. Didn't quite know what that speed was, but wasn't particularly high and we are in a climb. I've cut the throttle back just a little bit because I think just the three engines are probably a little much in the lower part of the atmosphere, but I don't know. So the, the mission plan here, the mission plan here is just to simply see how high and how fast we can get this thing going. Oh, oh, we got lights. Cockpit lights, sweet. This thing definitely needs more lights though. You know, once you know, this is this is just a prototype, right? We'll put lights on the finished product and all that kind of stuff for sure. Okay, let's increase the throttle. Let's see how fast we can get this thing going. Okay, we are at Mach 5 right there. 175 meters per second. Let's keep going. I want to be able to crack 20 kilometers and well as fast as I faster I can go the better as far as I'm concerned we have just cracked the sound barrier no effort whatsoever we are still going up level off just a little bit 10 kilometer altitude It is very stable. That's one thing that's really nice. And now I know the aerodynamic model is very, very simple in Kerbal Space Program. Those people that play with Ferrum Aerospace, and I played a little bit with Ferrum Aerospace myself, you build crafts like this and they they take a lot of tweaking. It is, a, you, you folks out there that play Ferrum regularly and build supersonic and hypersonic craft, you know, a tip of the hat to you uh, because uh, I, know, I know how difficult that is. I know how you know how much tweaking you have to do to uh, to get everything working. I'm a build and fly type of a guy, so I prefer to just uh, not spend that much time in the space plane hangar. But let's see, what are we at? Mach 1.8, just about. Nice leveling off. We are just about at 20 kilometers, almost. There it is, 20 kilometers altitude, no issues whatsoever. Thrust, uh, I'm only at about two-thirds thrust. It's still about 80 kilonewtons. Maximum thrust is well over 100 kilonewtons, so uh, those ram air intakes are certainly doing their job. Let's keep, keep that altitude. Okay, full throttle. Let's see how fast we can go. Oh, oh, those are sweet, sweet engine effects. And man, this engine is loud. Okay, we are well over two times the speed of sound now. What's that? Closing in on 690, 700 meters per second. And still accelerating. 
do want to get that altitude up. I want to keep it up about 20 kilometers. I don't want my altitude to fall down too much because if I get into the thicker part of the atmosphere traveling at this kind of speed, well, I'm likely to do some hurt to myself. Alrighty, love to get that altitude back over 20 kilometers. And then I'll level, I'll level off a little bit and see if we can get the speed back up again. Or well, the speed's been climbing all the time, but really start pushing where it climbs. Okay, 800 meters per second. That's what I want to see. You know, one of the things I'm thinking about too is, you know, if you can get this up in around 1,000 meters per second, and then put some rocket engines on this thing, you might have the beginnings of a space plane. I'm not quite sure if I'm going to get there yet. Still about 90 kilonewtons of thrust coming from those engines. Well over 800 meters per second. But I don't think I'm going to be hitting that thousand. No, I don't think that's in the cart. I don't think, I think I still need some better jet engines than these, believe it or not, for the space plane. But as far as a plane can get around Kerbin and get to high altitudes and do those things that you need to do, I think this thing's going to serve me fine. So here, we'll throttle down. We're good with that. Just throttle off. That's pretty good. So what I want to do is uh, that was a test of speed. And I think I was... I'm happy with that. There's no problem with that. It's going to do what it needs to do. And I also want to test maneuverability, but I'll get back into the space plane hangar, hangar and finish kitting this thing out and then do our maneuverability test. Alright, so we're back on the runway. Put the lights on. Yeah, that looks quite a bit better, I think. Now, one thing I did with the... Um, flaps that are on the wings there as you can see that they're alternating up and down there is this deploy mode and what I've done is I've attached that to the brakes action group so when I have the brakes on they deploy like that I'm hoping that they'll act a little bit like air brakes to help slow down the uh, the plane once it is on the runway I don't know if they work or not but I think it kind of looks good <laughs> anyway let's fire this guy up and get on the road we're not on the road what am I talking about? In the sky. Again, taking off about 70 meters per second. I was paying a little bit more attention, so that's its uh, that's around where its stall speed is, which is good. We're going to see how this is just sort of doing some bank turns around the KSC. I'll have to admit it, it's, it's a little more sluggish than the, uh, the Otter 1, which is a very nimble craft, and that's not surprising at all. This thing is quite a lot heavier. And now I'm going to have to sort of share, I think, what's going to be some of the bad news in this is uh, in the space plane hangar at the level that I have it at right now, this thing's going to take about 26 days to build, which, I mean, really isn't that bad if I had nothing else better to do with the space plane hangar. But the thing is, is that I do. Uh, I mentioned earlier on in this video that I have a plan for the seismic sensor um, and the modifications that the Interstellar mod has added to the seismic sensor. And uh, that involves using three different vessels, and two of those vessels are going to be Otter 1s. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push out uh, those vessels, including two Otter 1s. I'm going to do that mission, and then once that's sort of clear, then I'll put this into the building queue. So it's going to be a little bit down the road, a number of episodes down the road, when you will hopefully see this particular vessel. Um, so that's why I'm kind of talking about it right now. Why don't we talk about, why don't we see how it's like getting it down on the runway. So we'll turn this thing around and get it back towards the KSC. And here we are coming in for our landing. And, oh, a little bit hard there. I think I was a bit under my, whoa, whoa. Where are you going? Where are you going? <laughs> it's drifting over here to the right. I don't know why. Well, okay, take the... Ah, uh, okay. Got it back under control. I can now turn left again. I don't know what happened there. That was weird. I was saying that I was a little bit below my stall speed, I think. So that's why I kind of just kind of bonk, you know, dropped onto the runway. But uh, handled it okay. I'll have to check into why it sort of pulled to the right there. That could be just like uh, landing gear could be out of alignment or something like that. 
Anyway, otherwise that, that went pretty good. Let's let's see how quickly we can get this thing up to Mach 1. So we'll fire this up full throttle. And I'm just gonna pitch up. There we go. And we're just gonna go. And how long? I'm looking at the Mach speed indicator. And looking at when we're going to get the Mach 1, look at this thing go, climbing at about, what's that, about a 60 degree pitch? Mach 1, there we go. That was awesome. No, I think this is going to be a good plane for me, but uh, it might be a little bit before you see it. So I apologize for that, but that certainly was fun playing with right now. But I think it's get time to get back to the Karayan and get these folks back to their home station. Of course, Jeb is still busy bringing that orbit down before we get ready to make our rendezvous with the space station. And uh, oh, a tank of liquid fuel is leaking. Oh, wait, I can't. Okay, this is a serious one. Okay, which tank? Okay, that one's empty. Uh, wait, let's get that fuel balancer going. What the heck am I doing? Okay, liquid fuel, liquid fuel, just the liquid fuel. Oh, that one is going down. So, pump out, transfer out. Right, right, we might as well transfer out the oxidizer at the same time. Okay, so, okay, that tank is now empty. I probably lost a little bit of fuel in that, but not too much. Okay, how the heck do I turn off this alarm? Right click. Okay, that fuel's empty. There, turn off. Good. Whew, silence. Okay, well... I'm going to have to send Bill out there to fix this, which clearly, as we are obviously still in the atmosphere, he can't do right now. So we'll wait till we're out of the atmosphere. We're almost out of there. I am turning myself again to try and create some sort of downforce on the vessel to try and lower my periapsis even further. But I think once we're outside of the atmosphere, I'll make sure Bill gets out there and fixes that. Anyway, you see me do these dang it repairs before. Bill just needs to make sure to get a spare part from the capsule and then go down there and fix it. Oh, this has been an eventful series of aero braking maneuvers. We got we got our solar panels ripped off. We have to patch the fuel tank. Oh, and you know what? I think I'm actually going to do one more because I'm looking at my Apple Apps. It's 490 kilometers. I can bring it down a little bit lower than that. So we're going to do one more light aero braking pass. That brings it down to 206 kilometers. There we go. And now, now the, you know, the lower you bring your orbit, the more you get your orbits to match your target orbit, the less the rendezvous is going to cost you. So, but th this is close enough. I'm going to again try and do as much of the rendezvous burn at periapsis as I can. Uh, this burn's going to be another day away, but you know, we'll, we'll just cut straight to that, perform the burn, and then it's time to get this patched and hobble the vessel back to the space station. And as Jeb finishes off this docking, it'll get us five Kerbals on the station here. One of the problems that we have is that we actually only have sent vehicles for four, thanks to the rescuing of Luya, so uh, we'll have to deal with that. In addition, we're gonna have to do get most of these people back down to the surface because uh, I wanna start cashing in some of that experience and start leveling some of these folks up, and then it's time to start thinking about the next mission for the Karayan and bringing up the crew for that. But all of that is going to have to be for next episode. I thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.